Welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I'm your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and this is episode 207. Today is Wednesday, July 31st, year of our Lord, 2024. The primary is right around the corner here in Minnesota. August 13th, make sure that you tell all your friends and family, even if you're not a Minnesota resident yourself, to make sure they go out and vote in the Minnesota primary. And the primaries are important. And and we do not want to have elections stolen from us during the primary. And when I say stolen, I don't mean stolen literally. I mean by by a way of uh, lack of participation. Many people don't even know that there's a primary on August 13th, and that, that's not by accident. It's very, uh, it's very intentional that many of your primaries fly under the radar. It gives uh, the establishment all across this country the opportunity to, to right any wrongs that happened in their grassroots endorsement processes. Now, here in Minnesota, we have a, a favorable unity, I believe, from the grassroots to the party. And um, if the Minnesota rally is any example of that, where Donald Trump uh really uh let's say <laughs> got the entire mainstream media up uh, in uh in in a, in a tizzy because of the the support the amount of support and enthusiasm that Donald Trump had here in St. Cloud at his rally over 8000 people in attendance at the arena itself and and another several thousand outside in the overflow crowd uh is a sign that Minnesota Minnesota even, which is considered to be a deep blue, Democrat safe, liberal state, um, is shifting. And my endorsement is a sign of that shift as well. And that's not me saying it. That is the New York Times saying that the precinct strategy, which you can go uh, find out more information about at precinctstrategy.com, the precinct strategy in the war room with the great Steve Bannon, who we are keeping in our thoughts and prayers and, and and hopes and anticipation of, of him getting out early enough to be, be a participant in the rest of this election season. Those two things, precinct strategy and Steve Bannon, were greatly responsible for my endorsement, uh, which I aided some in as well as going up and, and delivering a, what I thought to be a very genuine, authentic, and, and, and precise speech at the, at the state convention. That being said, you got to make sure that you vote in the primary. Make sure that you vote in the primary or you end up in a general election with candidates that you, you maybe didn't want, you maybe don't know, you, you maybe don't, don't really have a, an interest in or are invested in. If you're invested in my candidacy and my campaign, please do not forget to vote in the August 13th primary. With that being said, I'm going to go way, way off, way off script here today. I mean, I got to go, I got to go completely off the script. I'm going to go so far off script, I don't even know if I'm going to have time to get to it all because it's going to get that serious. It's going to get that intense today. I hope you're ready. I hope you're okay with it. I hope you got some time. Let's start with this. Donald Trump lives. I haven't been in the chair, in this chair, since Donald Trump's uh, failed assassination attempt at his rally there in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. I haven't been in this chair solo to talk to you direct since they tried to kill Donald Trump. And a great number of things have happened since then as well. Joe Biden falls out of the race, Kamala Harris, she gets the nod, and, and, and then we have the Trump rally, and, and there's all kinds of things breaking out. I was called anti-Semitic by a number of uh, news organizations. I mean, we're going to get to the whole gamut of it today. If you want to know what Royce White is about, If you've only ever heard through headlines, if you've only ever heard by rumor or or by telephone gossip, if you've only ever heard of me through Google or or something that somebody else said, today you get a chance to know exactly what this campaign and my candidacy is all about. Donald Trump lives. A man was touched by God. Flaws and all. And it usually happens that way, doesn't it? For all you Christians out there. It usually happens that way in the Bible where the the flawed amongst us, 
are chosen for a greater path and a greater purpose. They're chosen to, to do a job, to do something that God needs them to do, that God sees only fit for them to do. So flaws and all, Donald J. Trump was touched by God. And, and, and the only way you can explain a man having three bullets miss his head by millimeters is an act of God, a miracle. Now, right away, you're anti-Christian. First of all, before I even go there, everything that proceeded afterward, everything that has, has happened in the days after Donald Trump's miracle were intended to distract you from that miracle. And that includes Joe Biden, and that includes Kamala Harris, and that includes the, the Olympics and the, the anti-Christian ceremonies that are taking place there in Paris. All of it is intended to distract you from that miracle. Three bullets miss a man's head by millimeters. A miracle. And immediately, I, I saw one of the strangest things I think I, I ever have witnessed in my 33 years of being alive. There was this, there was this coordinated and, and almost simultaneous release of propaganda and misinformation that started to call the Donald Trump failed assassination a hoax. It was staged. And, and, and you know, when you say it was a miracle and, and God put his hand on, on Donald Trump, which he did, the response from some of your uh, social media trolls was, well, well, then why didn't God save the the man that was that was killed in the crowd behind him. And then some other people from that same cohort, or let's say they probably will vote the same way or they have the same distaste for Donald Trump and they have the same distaste for all of you out there who believe in having a country. Or let's say more simple things like there are men and there are women. All of those people in that cohort, they end up voting pretty much the same way. And either they said that the that that God, that it wasn't a miracle and God wasn't with the man who, who ended up being killed in the crowd behind Donald Trump, or they'll just come out and say out that it was the whole thing was was staged. See, but you can't really have it both ways, huh? I mean, the, the, the two don't really mix. They don't square. If you're gonna say that that God, which you don't understand Christianity, there are plenty of people who who died in the Bible. Uh and and God was was active in the situation. For example, the 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 great story of Moses in the Exodus from Egypt. There were plenty of of, of people who who died uh, in that in that conflict in that story. Some got out. Some never made it to Israel. Some were were swallowed by the desert. <laughs> okay. So you don't have a good read of Christianity, which is why I don't let people who don't believe in God or have faith in God or at least have any understanding of the scripture question me about my Christian and morals, uh, my Christian uh, ethics and morals, because they're doing it to be flippant and dismissive. They're doing it to mock God. They're doing it to mock the Bible. They're doing it to mock Christ. And I just won't really participate in it. You tell those people to shut up. You don't got to play nice with them. No more niceties. Donald Trump was touched by God. It was a miracle. The man who was behind him that died was an unfortunate, an unfortunate and tragic outcome of that day. And may God have mercy on his soul and may he enter the kingdom of heaven. He was a hero. And if you know anything about the Bible, and if you know anything about Christian scripture, Hebrew scripture, you'll know that God tends to, to be favorable to those who are heroic in their final moments. That was the thief up on the cross, the thief who had led a life of, of sin. Yet in his final moments, as, as all of the crowd who, who weighed in against Christ, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That thief had been touched, had been inspired to the path of faith in his final moments. And it tells us that he ascended into heaven with Christ. That he was, he was welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. So, flaws and all, Donald Trump was touched by God. And all the anti-Christian, all the anti-Christian culture in our modern world is now weighed against him. 
in a way he may not even understand. How could he? I mean, we're talking about forces that are well beyond us, powers and principalities. And if, if ever, if ever you were on the fence about Donald J. Trump, if ever you had your doubts, if ever you thought, oh, I don't like him, I don't know if I can vote for him. God is not to be mocked. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. When you see a miracle, it's best that you, you testify to the miraculous, the miraculous event that you witnessed. You bear witness. If you're ever on the fence about Donald Trump, you shouldn't be now. A very clear line has been drawn in the sand. There are those who, who understand what they witnessed, what they saw, and there are those who will deny Christ until the final moments. So, in the days after, you know, Joe Biden miraculously gets sick, and I say miraculously in that way to be tongue-in-cheek, but Joe Biden conveniently gets sick out there on the campaign trail in the most uh, mysterious of circumstances, really. I mean, he's speaking one day, speaking the next day, all of a sudden he gets sick, he goes off the radar, he gets flown to a hospital, then he gets transported to another hospital and nobody hears from him. And then a letter is written that Kamala Harris is going to be given the nod for the Democratic presidential candidacy. Then there was that strange phone call during that, 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 uh, well, you want to call it a press event. I don't know what you want to call it. Is it the media event, whatever it was, you know, there was the, the wishing of Kamala, you know, the, the addressing of, of, of Joe Biden, giving a blessing to Kamala Harris to run for president out of the Democrat party. And there was this whole controversy that kind of slid under the, the radar of Joe Biden's uh, voice, maybe not being authentic, either being a recording or being an artificially intelligent created um, recording. I don't know. Obviously, I wasn't there. I mean, I'm not so so expert in, uh, in, in recording authentication or voice recognition that I can say just from listening whether or not it was a, a recording, his real voice, or it was AI generated. And that's a, that, that's a cautionary tale for everybody to understand where technology is advancing to and how dangerous uh, politics and government actually become in the presence of that technological advancement. I don't know. Would, it put, would, would, would I put it past the Democrats to have a Joe Biden recording to wish Kamala Harris uh, well and give the blessing for her to become the candidate? Absolutely not. Would I put it past them to use an, an AI-generated recording? I absolutely wouldn't. But hey, I'm the weird conspiracy theorist. Hey, it's not a conspiracy theory. Not a conspiracy theory that only a miracle could save Donald Trump with three bullets aimed right at his head and missed by millimeters. That, that you know, that's, to, to say that that's not a miracle or to say that the whole thing was staged, that's not a conspiracy theory. But to say that the Democrats would use a recording of a man who they claim is in perilous health condition, I mean, I mean that's just too far, okay? <laughs> that's just going way too far. That's weird, right? That would be That would be weird. That would make us all weird to have that skepticism. Okay, well, Kamala Harris gets the nod. And now we arrive at what I've been saying to you for the last two and a half years, that the referendum of American politics was going to fall back on race. And it is, and it always will, until we, the people, reconcile that issue and heal our rifts. Now, what do you mean? Oh, well, Royce, what do you mean? What do you mean? Oh, you know, don't talk about race. If you don't talk about it, it just goes away. It ain't going away. All of you out there may not be interested in race, but it surely is interested in you. And I was saying it back when I was on Jason Whitlock's show. And I was saying, don't get caught up in the, in the, the WWE politics where they pit black versus white to make off with the green. 
And what do we have? A country that's even more in debt than when I first popped on the scene. And there's no sign of a stopping. They're stealing more of your money than ever. And the way that they maintain power is to keep black people and white people separated. To keep black people and white people fighting. And if you want to see the motif of this at work, don't take my word for it. All you have to do is use your own eyes. Your own eyes show you. As soon as Donald Trump has a rally and a black endorsed candidate from the Republican Party who runs on a MAGA platform stands up in front of a crowd and takes a selfie with 8,000 American patriots behind him, the first thing they say in the comments is, look at all the white people. And when they run the, the Kamala Harris commencement event to, to celebrate her being the first black woman to run for United States president, they make sure they do it in the black capital of transgender and LGBTQ politics, also known as Black Hollywood there in Atlanta, Georgia. And they make sure to bring in Meg the Stallion, female rapper, to draw out the hip hop black culture and crowd to the event to show you the contrast between the Kamala Harris supporters and the Donald Trump supporters. Racial. And you can say that it doesn't matter. You can say that, it, that, that it's not a big deal. But we're going to talk about exactly why it is. It is because at 4 a.m. on Election Day, or let's say after Election Day, on 4 a.m. the next day, there will be a discrepancy about the votes. We already know it's coming. Let's just cut the bullshit. We know it's coming. There will be a discrepancy in a number of states about the votes. We have to overwhelm the system, and we can't overwhelm the system. But there will be some discrepancy, and it will be incumbent upon all of these Republican governors in their respective states and all of these conservative activists and attorneys and think tanks and so on and so forth and judges and whoever else. It'll be incumbent upon all of them to make sure that the, the people of this country, the American citizens, are not cheated out of our right to have a fair and square election. It will be under, it will be on them at that moment to stand up, be leaders, have courage, and say, let's make sure we get this right. But the discrepancy is coming. And where do you think that discrepancy is going to be? Do you think that discrepancy is going to be in the suburbs of your metropolitan areas? Oh, well, we've already seen this story play out once before. We know where the discrepancies are going to be. The discrepancies are always going to be in the inner cities. And right around 4 a.m., they'll say, hey, you know, the, the metropolitan areas are the most uh, densely populated, and therefore it, 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 it poses the greatest, uh, uh, you know, hurdle. It poses the greatest, uh, you know, problems. It poses the greatest problems with being able to count the votes because there's more votes. There's more votes. There's more of a rush. There's more, you know, there's more to be done in, 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 in Detroit, Michigan, in Atlanta, Georgia, in Pittsburgh, in Cleveland in Chicago, in Minneapolis. There's more votes to be counted. That's what the story is going to be. You know it. You know it and I know it. And you don't think that that's racial? You don't think that's a racially driven narrative? That black people are, are for sure going to vote Democrat. And every time there's a discrepancy or a close electoral race, we can always count on counting ballots after the buzzer on behalf of the Democrats because black people vote Democrat. You don't think that's racial? And even more importantly, you don't think that you've bought into it? And I'm talking to conservatives now. I'm talking to you white folks out there in the country. You don't think, you don't think you've bought into that narrative? Because I'm watching people buy into the narrative. I'm hearing it. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing a Senator Daines. Senator Daines. Is, Senator Gaines. Let me see what this guy's name is. See, one second here. I don't want to misspeak. I don't want to I want to give you the wrong information. 
Uh, yes, Steve Daines. Yes, Steve Daines, Senator Steve Daines, head of the uh, National Republican Senatorial Committee. I want to hear Steve Daines talk about election integrity. I want to hear any of these mealy mouth college educated mainstream Republicans talk about election integrity and security with a full throat. Not out of both sides of their mouth, with a full throat. Are the elections secure or aren't they? And if they're not secure, then why three months before the elections are we not taking drastic measures in the House of Representatives to bring motions to make sure that the elections are secure as possible? Why is the National Republican Senatorial Committee head not using the platform that he has to go out and ensure that our elections are going to be secure instead of weighing in on my senatorial race where the will of the people and the delegates of this state and our Republican Party have already spoken. I'm the candidate they want to go and fight against Amy Klobuchar and the general. But you got time to speak about that. But I, but I can't find you really talking about election integrity with a full throat. I can't find you talking about what the, the NRSC is going to do to ensure that the, the Senate majority is won on, on any legal technicalities that may come up in light of our, our knowledge that the elections have significant fraud. And they do. And it was proven. It's been proven. We don't even have to go to what, what a court found or didn't find. We know by the fact that we can't question our elections integrity that there must be a problem there. We know by the fact that the, the elections and the machines are, are considered proprietary technology that we can't look at to adjudicate the process by which votes are casted. We know there's probably a problem there. And who are they going to use to justify that would be you out there, black folks. You're going to be the ones used to justify any fraud that happens in these elections. Well, how do we combat that? You know, I, I've been saying the elections are not only mathematical and material, they're also spiritual. And every time an election is won or lost, there's a spiritual outcome. There's a, there's a spiritual result. People are left feeling away. They're, they're left feeling something. Sometimes it's indifferent. Sometimes they feel victorious. Sometimes they feel the process went the way it should. Sometimes they feel cheated. Sometimes they're too distracted to feel anything at all. And that's probably the most dangerous one. So what do we get to do? We we American citizens, we American patriots, we get to form ourselves around the possibilities. And that's what your founding fathers did. And don't you ever let any one of these mealy mouth globalists tell you that it's anything other than American to assume the worst and hope for the best, because that's exactly how this country was founded. Your country was founded on ideas where your founding fathers started from the worst case scenario and they worked their way back in to the best case scenario. They planned for the worst. They hoped for the best. That's the way our formation of government and the idea of our citizenship was constructed. We assume that if you give the government too much power, it'll become tyrannical. We assume we assume that if you don't have checks and balances, then you're inviting tyranny. We assume that if the, the citizens aren't, aren't armed, if the citizens aren't armed and don't have the right to bear arms, it invites tyranny. These truths we find to be self-evident. We assume the worst. We pray for the best. Don't ever let anybody call you a conspiracy theorist for questioning and being skeptical of your government. That's exactly what you're supposed to do as an American citizen. And so right now, all of us out here, all of us outside of the machine, all of us get to form up around the possibilities that our citizenship is being undermined by forces that we can't see and can't identify. 
What's the first step? The first step is we're going to break down this race narrative, and we're going to break it down good. We're going to break it down precise. We're going to break it down forever. That should be our goal. Because as bad as things have gotten, as, as, as strange of times as it seems we live in when it comes to the racial relations in this country, or at least the narrative, we also have, have pushed ourselves to a pretty positive place as well, simultaneously. There's a glass ceiling we just can't seem to break through. And you know who has the best chance to, to help a culture, a society, a country, a nation break through false narratives, break through the glass ceilings of false narratives, of misinformation? Candidates like me. Candidates like me who just tell it to you the way it is. Kamala Harris ain't black. Let's just talk. Let's just talk about it. And all you black folks out there know exactly what I'm saying. She's not black. And there, for all of you white folks out there who don't know this or may not have encountered this yet, there is a significant rift in the black community between those of us who are descendants of slaves or what they call foundational black Americans. Black Americans whose relatives, descendants, were a part of the American slave trade, were slaves in this country and black people who are considered black because of the color of their skin, but come from other places around the world. This may be new to you, but it does exist. And this is why on day one, when Kamala Harris got the nod to run for president and she made her big announcement and the entire white liberal run mainstream media coalesced around her, most of it, some of it still giving some kickback, but most of it, when that happened, you saw a number of black people all across this country take to social media to say, we're not voting for Kamala Harris. She's not black. And you may think to yourself, what do you mean? Why are these black people saying that Kamala Harris isn't black? Well, one, it's because she's Indian. And the Jamaican in her has always been seen as a, a sort of, uh, or is even more now seen as a sort of, uh, historical schism between those of us that are foundational black Americans and those of us who aren't. And let me, t and let, let me give you a reference. The great Thomas Sowell pointed this out. You can go back and find one of his most, um, one of his most popular interviews on YouTube. And he talks about the difference between slavery in the Indies and the West Indies and the Caribbean and slavery here. And one of those differences was the the systematic the systematic um, use of the slaves, and what I mean by that is, as he explained, um, the West Indies and the Caribbean didn't have the benefit or the luxury to have, have such a, a a broad base industrial base of slavery and sheer amount of slaves and infrastructure for their slave trade. Thus. The slave owners of the West Indies and the Caribbean were forced to give their slaves more autonomy and independence. As to where in America, there were so many slaves, the sheer number of slaves posed a certain security risk, and they were intentionally kept dependent on the slave masters or the slave owner or the plantation, let's say. They were intentionally kept dependent as a mechanism to ensure that they didn't rise up as easily. It's a fact. The great Thomas Sowell said it himself. And as a consequence, black people in this country, foundational black Americans, were sort of systematically brought up and enculturated in a, a, a post-slavery America where they would be dependent on the government, right? Because the government took the place of the slave plantation when they were freed from slavery. So we were kind of predisposed to that, that dependency that we now recognize as the welfare state. Whereas your West Indy immigrants that come to this country came from a culture where their families grew up more independent, even within the context of slavery, and thus have seemed to have a little bit more of a, um, let's say, a, a drive and work ethic. And in that culture of having a better drive and work ethic, you will often find that your West Indy and Caribbean immigrants tend to look down on American black folks. They go, ah, y'all don't really want it. Y'all don't really work hard enough. Y'all are making excuses. 
And in the final analysis, your individuals like Larry Elder would say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, and where they make a mistake is they go, there's no such thing as systemic racism. Well, the great Thomas Sowell had a different opinion on that. Actually, when you say that we were strategically kept dependent on the slave plantation, you are, in fact, admitting that there is a such thing as systemic racism. In the final analysis, Christianity and ideas like it would emphasize the human spirit and free will and consciousness that was given to us by God that supersedes any set of circumstances that we're brainwashed and culturated or systemically bred into. So in the final analysis, yes, we did in this country, American black descendants of slaves, foundational black Americans, we did come up in a system of, of psychological enslavement that proceeds till today, to this very day. But you as an individual have the, the power, have the, 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 the free will to choose better for yourself. Now, that has proven to be a difficult task for many in the black community, which is why we often spend more time fighting ourselves than, than coming together and rising up and, and claiming the prosperity and well-being that is out there for us. Part of that problem is that there's always some black skin puppet that pops up right around the time we get to cast one of the most important things we have in this country, and that is our vote. Always a black puppet that pops up and says, oh, wait a minute, black folks, you should vote for me. And the Democrats have monopolized this racket. I mean, we know the story. It's not, a, it's, you know, it's, this ain't conspiracy theory. Black people, they say, have voted Democrat for the better part of the last 60 years since the Civil Rights Act. Now, I would contest that. I would say where elections have been rigged, they have probably, they have most likely been rigged around black folks because the narrative is so weak. And wherever the narrative is most weak, on either side of the aisle, in the broadest of the American population, wherever that narrative is weak, that's going to be where it's easiest to cheat. Wherever the prejudgments about the, the thing being discussed are the, the, the weakest. And when I say weakest, I mean uh, most casually constructed. It's like, oh, well, people in Detroit are going to vote Democrat. Wherever that exists, that's where it's going to be easiest to cheat. And there's nothing that says they haven't been cheating for a long time. When it comes to black folks, at least. Black people are going to vote Democrat. That's the narrative. So black people are going to vote for Kamala Harris because she's black. And black rappers are going to go out and support Kamala Harris because, uh, let's say, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, personally advantageous for them to do so. Because the corporations are now going to line people's pockets who play nice and bend the knee to identity politics and DEI and all these other woke corporate agendas that now, uh, uh, let's say, corrupt the money from top to bottom in this country and all around the world. Any of these rappers who will step up now and support Kamala Harris, we got a special place for you. We got a special prize for you. You're going to get to come to the White House and shake hands and take pictures, and we'll give you a little pin from the president and make you feel special. There's always some Negro that's willing to do that. There's always some Negro willing to stand up like Kamala Harris. And, and what's scary is when you really look into those people's history, you most often find not only are they, uh, not, only are they not who they say they are, they're the exact opposite of who they say they are. And there's a difference. I mean, you could embellish and say, hey, when I was in high school, I wrestled a live tiger in the, in the atrium at the, uh, you know, at the high school, and everybody saw it and it was a you know, proud, victorious moment. 
and maybe you didn't wrestle a live tiger or cougar at, at the high school, or maybe you didn't score as many touchdowns as you said when you played pee wee football. Or, you know, that's one thing, but but to be the exact opposite of what you say is something different. Kamala Harris isn't just uh, a puppet. She's anti-black. I mean, her history says I'm anti-black, at least by the measures of her own political cohort. I mean, her own political cohort make the broad assumption that systemic racism exists, that this country was founded on white supremacy, and, and because of that fact that all of the institutions in our country are inherently corrupted by white supremacy, which would include the justice system, which would include the reason why black men are disproportionately prosecuted. And, and we're supposed to look away from it when it's Kamala Harris because she's running for president as a Democrat. We're supposed to look away from her, her history as a prosecutor there in California and how many black men she saw and presided over the cases where they were thrown into prison for marijuana charges. And now she's going to what? Come to the forefront of a national stage and a national spotlight and talk about how marijuana should be legal because it's politically advantageous. And this is why. And, and look, I'm not saying nothing new. You're seeing right now. I saw a black, a young black girl the other day on Instagram say, I'm voting for Jill Stein. She wouldn't say she's voting for Donald Trump, but she said, I'm certainly not voting for Kamala Harris. But if we don't rally around this racial reconciliation and healing, this narrative will be used against us. See, misinformation is not just outright lies. It's, it's lies, it's, it's innuendo, and it's the truth taken out of context. It's the same thing that's going on with my Senate, candidate, uh, my Senate campaign here in Minnesota, Star Tribune. They continue to say that I'm a Black Lives Matter protester, even though they know it's not true. Even though they know it's not true, they're going to say it anyway. Because what, 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 what am I going to do about it? Sue them? That's what they want. They want me to try and they want me to use uh, campaign funds or, or personal uh, resources and, and to get tied up in, in some lawsuit. And maybe we do. Maybe we do sue the Star Tribune for, for libel, for, for slander. But who's going to overhear the, 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 the case? <laughs> and they know that as well. And so all they're saying is they think you all are stupid. They think you all are stupid, and they think you are dead set on living in a country that's racially divided. And if there are any black MAGA patriots like me who will stand up and tell you the truth, they're, they're banking on the fact that it's so emotionally and psychologically uncomfortable for you that you'd rather turn it off rather than lean into it and do the necessary work. And that necessary work is simple. It really is. There is a narrative about every last one of us that was at that Trump rally on Saturday up in St. Cloud, that all of those American citizens, all those God country loving citizens are racist. And they'll say that I'm just the exception. I mean, they're gonna water down racism to a point where it has no meaning, which does undermine their stories about the historical racism and let you know exactly who the Democrats are. Because real racists, just like real anti-Semites, they don't feel the need to, to lie. They don't feel the need to, to use black people or, or Jews for their own gain. They, they don't feel the need for that. They, the, the real racists, the real white supremacists have a sense of racial superiority. They, they, they wouldn't belittle themselves down to needing you or tolerating your blackness out of necessity. It don't work like that with real racists. Anything else that would do that, that may say something racist, that's something different entirely. That's not the same thing. We're talking about real racism. Real racist people don't accept and tolerate those individuals they're racist against for their own expediency. That ain't how it works. All that microaggression, racism stuff, that's just a way to expand the definition in the university so they can justify teaching it in the grade schools so everybody's walking around mad at each other before we even know each other's name. Bullshit. Those people in that arena on Saturday up in St. Cloud at the Trump rally aren't racist. They just want to have a country. They just don't want to have their country be run 
by liberals and communists who say that a man can become a woman on any given day they choose. That's all. How many racists do you know stand up and give an ovation to a black militant? Not just a black man. I mean, God bless Larry Elder and Ben Carson and, and the whole lot of them, and I like them, respect them. They got a lot of great things to say, but they're not me, and I'm not them. I'm a black militant. I'm, I'm pretty radical. I mean, I don't think I'm radical. It's just my delivery, my presentation. You know, I, I'm not with all the, the, the English Commonwealth niceties of these mealy mouth academics. I don't really play like that. I, I, don't, I don't see that, that as being necessary, especially when everybody else is throwing out all the rules and lying every chance they get. I don't, I don't feel the need to play nice with liars. Where I'm from, if you want to cheat and you want to lie, let's just fight then. May the best man win. But I'm certainly not going to play nice with you. So I'm different. I'm a black militant. And for some reason, some odd, strange reason, all these white folks who support Donald Trump, who you guys out there think are racist or describe as racist or try and paint or characterize as racist, all of them gave me a standing ovation. Not only did they give me a standing ovation, they took time to walk from their seats to where I was to take pictures. Is, 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 that the, is that the mentality of a racist? Well, maybe you guys want to water down the definition of racism, but, but I don't want to do that. And, and you know what? I think there are a lot of other black people in the country who are fed up with this narrative, who are fed up with this watered down version of racism. You can hold over our head and, and scare us into voting Democrat. I think there's a lot of Negroes out there who are just tired of it. And we don't care about you calling us Uncle Toms and we don't care about you calling us race traitors. And you don't care. We don't care about you saying that, you know, all kin, all kin folk ain't skin, all skin folk ain't kin folk. We don't care about none of that shit. I don't care about none of that shit. And that's why your, your Senator Steve, get dang, Steve, Steve, uh, what, what, what's his name again? I don't know. him. I don't know. him. Senator Steve Gaines. Danes. I'm sorry. I keep getting it wrong. Senator Steve Daines. That's why Senator Steve Daines says that I'm not electable. Because <laughs> in order to be electable, in order to be electable in this day and age for your mainstream politicians on either side of the aisle, you would have to be somebody who gives a shit what people think about you. I mean, that's the whole game of electoral politics. It's been the whole game of electoral politics for a long time. This is a common culture we've accepted. Whether you're black, white, brown, green, doesn't matter. This is kind of one of those things that we've all just allowed to, to manifest and, and metastasize in our society. Everybody wants to be liked. And now it's even worse because of social media. Everybody wants to be liked. Well, the man who's liked in a society full of lies is, is, is no better than... than than the worst amongst us. There, there's, a certain, there's a certain value to not being liked by everybody. I don't want to be liked by everybody. If you think that you can be a man on one day and become a woman on the next day, I don't want you to like me. If you think we can have a country without having a border, I don't want you to like me. If you think we can have a country being $36 trillion in debt, I don't want you to like me. If you think we can have a country defending everybody else's borders more than we defend our own, I just don't want you to like me. I'm cool with that. That is what you call a, a, a fundamental difference of opinion and worldview. And I'm okay with that. The question is, how many people out there are going to vote or maybe not vote that haven't even thought those issues through. And those are the people that we need to be trying to go and minister to. And what I'm saying to you today is we can heal this rift. Minnesota was the epicenter and has been the epicenter of racial tension since the day George Floyd died. And four years later, we have a chance as a swing state to construct, to participate in, a racial reconciliation and healing that could be an example for the entire country and thus a beacon of freedom for the whole world. And I'm not talking about singing, we are the world or kumbaya. 
in any superficial way. What I'm saying is the narrative is so potent from the mainstream media that the racial hatred in this country still exists today at a level which all of you, black people and white people, would gladly trade your freedom for the false sense of security that the government is going to keep you too divided so you don't fight. That's the scam. Oh, the government, we're going we're gonna to separate you black and white folks from each other so you don't tear each other's head off. That's the scam. All the while, they're stealing your money. And what I pose a, a threat to do, the reason why I'm dangerous to, to, to Senator Steve Daines and the rest of the National Republican Sen Senatorial Committee and the rest of your mainstream Republicans all across the country, the, the, the threat that I pose is I disrupt the racket, the industry, the industry of politics on both sides of the aisle. This whole thing could be over in an instant. But it's going to require some work. It's going to requ require some honesty, some truth. It's going to require some people to reveal themselves and their real agenda. Me, I don't have an agenda. So, for example, when I'm in Baxter, Minnesota, and I'm at a Christian church, <laughs> I start off a speech just last night by saying, um, you know, you all are white. I'm black. You're not European. I'm not African-American. We're all Americans. You're white. Raise your hand if you're white. People raise their hand, but you can feel the air, the, the, the emotion of the air kind of gets sucked out of the room by even mentioning race. And I come back and I say, you're white. I, maybe I'll post a clip one of these days on my ex. With, you're white. It's okay. And the whole church erupts into laughter because there's that unspoken uncomfortability that we all realize has been put on us put on us by our, by our culture, by culture, by American culture. It's been put on us. We've grown up with it. We live with it. We understand it. We watch it. We see it. We hear it. We feel it. There's a, there's a racial tension that if we could just get over, then maybe the elites that are, that are running this country and, 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 and stealing from us you know, could be defeated. Just maybe we could defeat them. If we could get over that, who's going to go first? I went first. Yes, I went first. After the George Floyd situation, I was down there in the belly of the beast as a black man from my own community, listening to what everybody was saying, and I came up to one conclusion. The people who have been put out here at the front line of these black activist movements are either lying, stupid, or they're in on it. The scam. Either they're stupid or they're in on the scam. I'm talking about the leaders now. Now your average person who shows up with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, their life is going a mile a minute like anybody else in the country. All they see is the most potent, emotional, visceral thing that, that comes across their, their smartphone. And on that day, it was George Floyd, uh, you know, dying out there on the street on, on, uh, in South Minneapolis. Of course, it's going to have an emotional impact on everybody who saw it, especially the people who are running around this country like a rat maze. And that's not restricted to the poor. That's everybody up and down the socioeconomic ladder. Everybody's life is going a mile a minute, and it's going even faster now, and that ain't by accident. So when you see something like, like George Floyd dying in that incident, that it, 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 of course it's going to pull on you. Everybody who wears a Black Lives Matter t-shirt isn't a part of that organization. The saying on a t-shirt isn't an affiliation with the organization. You got the organization incorporated as a nonprofit stealing millions of dollars from situations like George Floyd. And you got the people who believe that police could do a better job and hate to see when a black person is killed unjustly, who wear a shirt that says Black Lives Matter. They don't know nothing about the organization or about the politics. After I diagnosed the situation, I thought to myself, oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I know what's going on here. These 
Black activist leaders are going to keep the conversation around police so they never have to talk about the way the money works. Why? Because they're in on the way the money works. The people who fund them run the way the money works. They organize and orchestrate the way the money works. They were there when the way the money works was first put into play. And all you got to do is go and dig a little. Black Lives Matter, way down the trough in terms of organi organizational hierarchy of the left and Democrat politics. Uh, let's say liberal politics all around the world. Black Lives Matter, way down the organizational hierarchy chart. Way down there. Big in impact. Big in influence, love to smack it all over television and all over social media, love to make Black Lives Matter the scapegoat of our cultural decay. But is it really on them? No, they're just a tool. They're way down there on the depth chart. They don't got no juice. They don't got no control. Three trans women ain't running this country. They're not running this world. Three trans women that put together an activist grassroots organization in inner cities all across this country after Trayvon Martin died, ain't running this country. They're not running the world. Hell, they're not even running the communities they live in. They damn sure not running Minneapolis. Ain't no Black Lives Matter activists running this city. They're not running this city in business. They're not running this city in crime. They're not running this city in politics. That's a fact. Take it to the bank. They're puppets. And I found out firsthand because when they're pressed about real issues like the Federal Reserve, they get the ah, him and him and him and him and That's how they talk. They don't want to talk about that. When they get pressed on an issue like the LGBTQ, they get the him and ha. Why? They're puppets. They're not supposed to have a response to that. Their response is supposed to be exactly what you heard for four years straight every time they march one of these bourgeois Negroes up on television to talk about racism. That's the reality. And now we get a chance to understand, not only understand that that's the reality, that's the truth, now we get to act on it. Now's our chance to show that we're more interested in having a country than we are in being divided. And if we don't do that, if we're not willing to do that, then us standing up and singing that national anthem together, seven, eight thousand in one accord at the Trump rally is for nothing. Because I guarantee you, you're not European and I'm not African. We're American and this country's under attack and it's under attack right now. And if we don't step up, if we don't step up and surrender our prejudgments about one another, we will lose this country forever. You get the chance right now. And I told the individuals at the town hall yesterday, and I continue to tell them, when we get through this primary on August 13th, I will be bringing the Republicans from rural Minnesota into the city to meet the black people who have this false notion that every white person who wears a Trump hat is racist. We're going to facilitate the town halls, the two communities coming together and having that racial reconciliation and healing, having that conversation. Don't you find it odd? Don't you find it odd that your leaders, that your black bourgeois elites always tell you that there's a white boogie band, but they never want you. They never want to bring you to the table to have a peaceful dialogue about about your differences, about any differences that may exist. Doesn't that seem like a predicate for war? Doesn't it seem like we have war zones breaking out in this country right now? And they're not racial war zones yet. Not yet. That ain't the big problem. The big problem I see is young black men shooting each other all over the country. That's the issue that worries me. My young, my, my little, my two little brothers, young black men. My little cousins, young black men. Listen to rappers talking about shooting each other for no fucking reason and thinking that that shit's cool, along with getting high and, and, and tearing your brain apart from the, from the head to the toe, from head to toe, tearing your spirit apart with drugs and everything else you shove in your body. I see that as a problem. But your same entertainers like Meg the Stallion want to talk about 
politics and 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 reference Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and and these people ain't nothing like the individuals who sacrificed their life for us to move forward in this country. It is a lie. And you all should be ashamed. And when I run into any of the any of these celebrities out here who I catch talking about that, they don't even they don't even talk to me. They know cuz I'll spit right at their feet. I'm that serious about it. I'm that serious in general. And that's why your mainstream Republicans don't like me. Because they know I actually can move the needle. Because to move the needle, you have to have courage, you have to have dedication, but even more importantly, you have to understand the issues and you have to be able to articulate the issues. They don't like Negroes who can articulate the issues. Why? Is it racism? No. It's not racism. It's because the divide and the split between black people and white people in this country helps them perpetuate the scam. It's evolved well past racism. It's on to full-blown, selfish narcissism now. It ain't got nothing to do with race anymore, really. Because the same slavery that, that black people went through is the, is the slavery they now have planned for all of you working-class white folks. That's why Hillary Clinton called you deplorable, and that's why she didn't seem ashamed to do it. She wasn't ashamed because she was, she was putting out a message to the whole world that technology has reached a place where our agenda now sees beyond race. This is the great scam of the whole kumbaya, we are the world edifice that your globalist elites are running on you. This is the, this is the real dishonesty of it. They're not saying we are the world, we want to hold hands and, and give everybody prosperity and well-being. That's not the goal. What they're saying to you is, we have now elevated beyond, above, a racial framework. All of y'all are nothing but niggas now. <laughs> That's why the NRSC doesn't want to endorse me for United States Senate, because I talk like that. I talk that real. All of y'all out there ain't nothing but niggas now. All of you have been, been supplanted by technological advancement and elitist worldview. All of you are beneath the line of what we would call essential. Y'all ain't essential. I don't care if you're white, black, I don't care if you're Irish, Jamaican, Asian. If you don't produce human beings, if you can't mass produce human beings, you're useless. And we know what they want to do with useless people. If you don't know, you better get familiar. When your world leaders, your, your world thought leaders say the only humane thing to do with human beings who, aren't use, who are useless is to give them some combination of drugs and, and video games, you better take heed to that warning because it is a warning. Or at least it should be. Or maybe you like it that way. Maybe you'd love a VR video game where you could be Kamala Harris. <laughs> you fucking kidding me? You kidding me? I'd rather get shot in the head than have to participate in a doped up video game where I could be a fake ass person like Kamala Harris. And, and see, the thing about me is I'm six foot eight with a 36 inch waist and green eyes. The only thing they can do is kill me or throw me in jail through lawfare. That's all they can do. Because because in reality, in, in society, away from the internet, where these weird people have, have tried to present themselves as being some, some kind of authority on what's rational and sane in the real world, like in the real world, when I walk into a room, I'm me. I don't need virtual reality. I'm usually the biggest thing in the room. I'm usually one of the smartest individuals in the room. And I'm usually one of the most dedicated and courageous leaders in the room. Put me in any room. Any room. And people ask, you know, well, why didn't you speak at the rally in St. Cloud on, on, on Saturday? Why didn't you speak? Why did they have you speak? I don't know. I can't speak on behalf of anybody else. What am I supposed to say? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Everybody there knew that they would that they would be good for me to speak. Everybody in there left asking the same question, and that speaks for itself, doesn't it? 
And I told you all, one of the things I, 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 I respect the most about my friend and mentor, Steve Bannon, is that when he and Donald Trump uh, had some friction, Steve never wavered in his loyalty once. That's the sign of a real soldier and a real leader. He said, Trump is our guy, flaws and all, differences aside. He's our guy, and I'm going to say the same thing. Donald Trump can endorse me. He cannot endorse me. He can invite me up to speak. He cannot invite me up to speak. It doesn't matter because it's not about him. The man was touched by God. It's not about him. It's about what he represents. It's about the role that he's been chosen, that he's been given, that he's been chosen for, that's been bestowed upon him. It's about the ideas that he represents. Ideas that are fundamental to being an American citizen. It's not about him. I don't take it personal. I'm not offended. Why wasn't I allowed to speak? I don't know. I don't know. Call your local representative. <laughs> Ask them. I could, I could probably guess. I could probably guess why. I could probably guess what the answer would be. The answer is we don't know what he'll say. And I like it like that. And I hope you grow to like it like that from your politicians, from your elected officials. They can't give me a script. Nobody can give me a script. There ain't no scripts anymore. We're just going to tell it like it is. We're just going to tell it like it is. But my point in saying that is, did I really have to get up there and speak? I stood outside in the in, in uh, you know uh, of the of the arena, and I went person to person in the ninety degree heat that all of you had to wait in as well. And I shook as many hands as I could. They said, "Oh, get up on the truck and ride on the truck, ride on the float." We had a big, beautiful float outside of the rally, which I absolutely love and can't thank the people who are involved in making that enough. It's, the flow was great. People, people love it, and, and people cheered when it went by, and that's awesome. It's a big picture of me on one side and Donald Trump on the other side. It's absolutely perfect. Um, but, but people get up on the float. I said, no, I want to touch as many of the constituents as I can. That's leadership. That's, that's real. That's genuine. That's authentic. It's from the heart. You can't fake this shit. What I'm about, what I represent, you can't fake that shit. It just, it just is or it isn't. I shook as many hands as I could. And when I came inside, my heart was warm to receive an, an ovation, an ovation, a standing ovation from the MAGA patriots that were there in St. Cloud. Now, how that doesn't translate to me being able to stand up and speak in front of the crowd, I don't know. Not for me to decide. Not necessary. Not even necessary to, 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 to work out. I'm on television. Three times a week, I got a three-hour podcast three nights a week that's that's on, you know, all, all over the internet, and I'm on radio five nights a week. I do enough talking. Being there, being there was special. Being there was inspirational. Being there was motivating. When you hear that national anthem ring out, when you hear that national anthem ring out through the stadium and all and, and 8,000 American citizens are all joined in, in, in song on one accord with one idea and one understanding in mind, shit is priceless. You can't put a price. It's, it's, it's not even quantifiable. You know, watching it back on video doesn't even do it justice, but it still brought a tear to my eye. It's one of those things you had to be there to witness. But I'll tell you, we have to solve this race issue still. We better solve it. We better get ahead of it now. Or else we'll all be sitting there in November and we'll be looking at each other in this frantic sort of uncertainty. Instead of being together and understanding exactly what took place. That's the choice we get to make this time. Last time, you could say we got caught with our pants down. Okay, fool me once, shame on me. No, sorry. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. As George Bush would say, okay, I can't, can't get fooled again, okay? 
I say that tongue in cheek because you all know that there's nobody more anti-Bush globalist cabal than we are here in the MAGA movement. Fuck George Bush. Some people would say they wouldn't vote for me just because of that. <laughs> and you are on the fast track to losing your country and your citizenship. And I'm going to get to that in a moment. But I want to finish on this race thing because I don't think there's anything more important, honestly. We have a chance to redefine American politics, but first we have to redefine this party and this movement. And a huge roadblock is this racial issue. And you're already seeing black people starting to make that turn. They're already starting to make that shift. They're already starting to, to, to make the journey across that political Rubicon. They're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not voting for Kamala Harris. Donald Trump is our guy. We, we understand politics and policy enough to know the difference of when Donald Trump was in office versus what these people are pitching, laws and all. That is a very, very good opportunity to triple and quadruple down. But first, we have to understand what it means to be an American citizen what the value of American citizenship is. We do. We have to understand it so we can effectively sell. We can sell that to the people who need to understand it better. They're looking for a place to go. They, they know, they understand. They get the confusion. They're confused. They know they're confused. They don't know anything else. They're waiting for somebody to articulate the message and put it together for them. Let me help you break it down. For all you black folks that are out there watching and all you white Republicans or MAGA patriots that want to understand how to, how to liaison to the black community so we don't get our elections stolen in Detroit, Atlanta, Pittsburgh, and Chicago or Minneapolis. Citizenship. There is not a more important intellectual development in the history of human civilization than citizenship. Why? To be a citizen of a country, to be a citizen of a nation, allows the most people, the biggest amount of people from the many walks of life to come together under the rubric of similar and same ideas. That's the value of citizenship. We're all something, but we're all one thing first. Thus, the movement, America first. We're all a bunch of different things. I'm black, I'm Norwegian, I'm Mexican, I'm tall, I play basketball, I'm in politics, I talk on the radio. We're all a bunch of things. But we all have to be one thing first. And that allows us to have any real sense of community. Whether that community be local, in your neighborhood, whether that be in your, your city, in your state, or in the country. We all have to be one thing first. And if we can be one thing first and agree on, let's say, a United States Constitution or Bill of Rights, or Declaration of Independence, if we can agree on those ideas first, now we can come together with the different nuances that we bring from the many walks of life. Citizenship. You're a citizen of this country. You white folks out there are not European. You black folks out there are not African. You're American. You're white, you're black, you're American. You are the fabric of this country. You are the bedrock of this country. Without you, there is no America. Without your strength and your courage and your discernment and your ability to sacrifice and come together to save this country, there will be no country. You are citizens of this country. You're not citizens of the whole world. And since the end of World War II, the post-World War II democratic liberal order has been the prevailing political ideology. And what it has used is identity to undermine citizenship, national citizenship, for global cooperation. And you've been sold a lie, whether you're black or white, 
that global cooperation is the best way to ensure peace and prosperity. But how peaceful are, 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 are things out there? How much peace do you have in your own life, in your neighborhoods, in your states, around the world? How peaceful is it? How prosperous is it? You tell me. Maybe I'm crazy. Please call me crazy, but I'm looking out my window at the world today, and I don't see much peace, and I don't see much prosperity. I see a culture of death and debt. And how sick of your elites to try and blame that on you, the working class, everyday average, average everyday American citizen, when they've been running things the entire time. How sick and twisted of your elites to understand the implications and power of social engineering, divide and conquer, monetary policy, foreign policy. How sick and twisted of them to say that the violence and chaos that exists in our society today isn't of their doing. They're not culpable. They're not liable. It's you. It's you all. It's you deplorable MAGA patriots. It's you ignorant Negroes down there in the, in the city. It's your fault. You're the reason why the country's this way. Hate yourself. Who taught you to hate yourself? Now the great Malcolm X's words are, are becoming even more poignant than ever before. Who taught you American citizens to hate yourselves? So much so that you can see the answer right before you, but you can't bring yourself to do it, to apply it. The, the fight is simple now. If black people and white people can't come together, we will lose this country. And there's a reason why the great Steve Bannon has emphasized the importance of the black and Hispanic working class. And that is the reason why they threw him in jail for this moment. Doesn't got anything to do with contempt of Congress. Doesn't got anything to do with anything else. The reason they threw Steve Bannon in jail is for this exact moment. Where they can stoke the racial hatred by putting a, a bourgeois puppet Indian woman up for president, calling her black and convincing all you other black folks in this country that you should vote black or at least turn the other turn the other cheek or look the other way when, when the election results come in and they say that you voted for the black woman. That's the game. That's the game. That's the narrative. And oh, that is what they are going to try and do. You see it now. You see it now. Look at how the polls have switched. Oh, now, you know, now all of a sudden Kamala's gotten a huge boost. How? We know nobody liked Kamala Harris when she ran for president. Nobody liked Kamala Harris when she ran for governor of California. Nobody's liked Kamala Harris her entire political career. Now, all of a sudden, we're supposed to believe that people want her to run the whole country. And the narrative is because black girl magic is so is so powerful. If you're willing if you're willing to vote for a politician based on their skin color and not their policies, you're dumb and a damn sellout. I'll say it again. If you are willing to vote for a politician based on their skin color and not their policies, you are dumb and a damn sellout. Spit on the floor. You make me sick. And back to my point about American citizenship, the fundamental value of being a citizen. What does it mean? What does it entail? It's simple. It's simple. If you don't have a country, you can't be a citizen. If you're not a citizen, you don't have rights. If you don't have rights, you don't have freedom. If you don't have freedom, you can't have well-being and prosperity. This ain't calculus. This ain't trigonometry. This is a simple equation. If you have a country and you're a citizen, then you can have rights 
which gives you freedom, which gives you the opportunity to achieve and reach prosperity and well-being. Without a border, you don't have a country. I mean, let's cut straight to the chase. If you don't have a border, you don't have a country. And citizenship is important, but borders are also important. But borders work in both directions. And the direction that the border's working in now is coming into the country. When 22 million, by popular consensus of mainstream scholars and researchers, 22 million illegal immigrants come into your country, wander on into your country, and you can't even call them illegal immigrants? You've had your country and your citizenship taken from you, stripped from you, stolen from you. If you don't believe me, do me a favor. Go ahead and, and, and try and board a flight to go to any other country in the world without your passport. Try and uh, take a, a car ride on up to the Canadian border and just walk on across. See how well that works out for you. Get your plane ticket, lie to Israel, and try and live there in Israel without the proper documentation. Fly to China, get you a flight to Beijing, and try and live there in Beijing without the proper documentation. And tell me how those things work out for you. Tell me how that goes. And then hopefully you'll understand just how corrupt it is that 22 million illegal immigrants have come into your country. And how it's an attack on you. It's not an attack on Republicans. It's not an attack on Donald Trump. This isn't a, a tit for tat with the, with the MAGA movement. They wanted to close the border and build a wall, so we're going to open it up and let as many illegal immigrants in. What kind of, what kind of stupid racket, what kind of stupid social, cultural narrative, narrative racket is that? Got nothing to do with that. They're just stealing from you. They're stealing your citizenship, the value of your citizenship. But black people are starting to understand that too, aren't they? And that's why they're scared. That's why they're nervous. Because all across the internet, you're seeing black people say, well, wait a minute, hold on. You mean to tell me? <laughs> you mean to tell me I can't even come to the city anymore and park my car, which is already hard enough to, to, to make payments on, let alone put gas in? Now I got to come to the to the city and I can't even park my car on the street because they got all of these meters that, that have to pay for the cities. I don't know, municipalities or whatever other budget items the city has to pay for yet. You're going to bring illegal immigrants who don't even have citizenship into the country and you're going to give them free housing and health care and tuition. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Even a Negro who ain't graduate high school can tell that that's a bad deal. That's a scam. That's some bullshit. Even a Negro who didn't graduate the sixth grade can tell that's some bullshit. And that's why the Democrats are panicking and, oh, they got to march. They got to march Kamala Harris out there and, and put her beautiful face with the, the hair back. Black girl magic. Oh, they got to. They're pulling out all the stops now. They're going to make you have to call out the black woman. See, because that, that's the tipping point of identity politics. We're going to put you in opposition of the black woman. And if we put you in opposition to the black woman, well, everybody feels sorry for the black woman. If you don't feel sorry for the black woman, then you're persona non grata. Well, number one, she's not a black woman. But number two, just as a cultural sentiment, I'm not giving over that I feel bad for all black women. Just like I don't feel bad for all black men. I don't feel bad for all white men, all white women, all it doesn't matter how you describe yourself or what your ethnicity and skin color is. I don't feel bad for you on face value. I want to get to know you. I want to know what you believe in. I want to know what you think. I want to know what your worldview is. I want to know if you believe in citizenship. If you don't believe in citizenship, I can't feel bad for you. We don't, we don't see the world the same.
So that you, you, you see, you see what they're going to, you see what they're doing it. They're doing it. But, but don't be mistaken now, in order for us to defeat this narrative, we're going to have to admit some, some uncomfortable things about ourselves. That's what we're going to have to do now. We're going to have to admit some uncomfortable stuff about us. Yeah. And that border works in both directions. Because borders ain't just a political construct. It's not just a line drawn in the sand by your political elites or your government. A border has a much deeper spiritual meaning. Just like I said, citizenship is one of the most important intellectual developments in the history of human civilization. So is borders. Formal borders are one of the most important intellectual developments in the history of human civilization. Why? Why? Citizen helps us stop from devolving into tribalism. Citizenship. It helps us from devolving into tribalism. Borders, even more important, even more personal. Borders place a limit on man's unfettered ambition to play God. That's the deep spiritual significance of borders. That's the important intellectual development that is borders. But those borders, they work in both directions. And, and you can't talk about having a border that you don't let people in across unless you talk about the border you're trying to push out across the world. Which is why we, here in the conservative movement, have to rid ourselves of the neocon plague in this party. And if you don't, you will lose your country. There's no ifs, ands, and buts. There's, there's no workaround. There's no workaround anymore. Either you're going to do it or you're going to lose your country. Either you're going to acknowledge the truth and deal with that reality or you are going to lose your country. We have to rid the Republican Party of this neocon plague. This neocon plague that says we can have a border there in Texas, but there are no other borders for us around the world. That we're going to push democracy through peace and strength to everybody out there, no matter who they are and what their culture is. They don't need democracy. They don't want it. If they want democracy, if they need democracy, they know about democracy now. It's not a new idea. If they want to be democratic nations, you let them be democratic nations on their own accord and their own free will. And I'll go back to the post-World War II democratic liberal order because you need to understand where your ideas came from, where the way that the government is structured and the way that our foreign policy is constructed. You need to understand where it came from. After World War II, we signed a deal with the British Empire, with Churchill, Churchill and Roosevelt, they signed a deal called the Atlantic Charter. You can go look it up. This ain't conspiracy theory. This is almanac history. The Atlantic Charter said that we would help the British against the Axis powers and against the German war machine in exchange for the British giving up and relinquishing their colonial empire. And as a condition of that, every nation would be allowed to become self-determining. But that's not what happened. Number one, the British didn't really relinquish their colonial empire because all of these nations still symbolically bow to the crown and to the commonwealth, including us. That's why we live under British admiralty law and our trade agreements or, or, or our, our international, uh, you know, our international, uh, you know, sea trade. British admiralty law, you still live under it today. You're not European. You're not British. We're not British. We fought a war to defect from the crown. And it may take you a few election cycles to understand this, but I guarantee you when you finally get fed up, this will be the referendum issue. Remember, I'm the one that told you, you're not British. You're not a member of the Commonwealth. You're American. You're an American citizen. So why is it that your sons and daughters have to pay with their blood and your money to uphold the freedom of all of Europe. Are they self-determining or are they a welfare state? You see how the welfare state that's in the black communities, 
just got expanded to our geopolitical collaboration and cooperation with all these other countries that serve as reverse vassal states where we pay them to protect them. You see how that works? Am I losing you? If I'm losing you, that's probably why they don't want me to be in the United States Senate because I know exactly how the scam works. I know exactly how it was built. I know exactly where the bones are buried because they, they didn't do a good job hiding them. It's almost like they're leaving them in plain sight just to mock you because they think you're stupid. And any politician who doesn't want to talk to you like they're stupid, they make up stories about. That's the truth. Any politician who doesn't talk to you like you're stupid, they make up stories about them. They want to smear their character. They want to talk about child support. They want to talk about my, my, ch my back child support that I was court ordered to pay at an NBA salary that I was no longer making. <laughs> like it's rational or reasonable or just for a court to determine that I should be responsible for paying a child support based on the salary that I'm not making. They want to talk about my FEC filings, about campaign expenditures and, and campaign funds that were spent that, that by, by now you may have noticed they've quieted down on. Because when we filed our amendments recently, it was, it was obvious that Royce White Royce White didn't spend one hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars of of campaign of campaign donations on on personal personal use. That was a lie. That was a misrepresentation of the facts. But they say that one none this. And and finally, last but not least, they call me a Black Lives Matter protester and an anti-Semite. I mean, I win the 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 the. Uh, the politically incorrect lottery, <laughs> right? All intended to keep you away from this, this, this knowledge, this history, that you're living under British Admiralty law, that after we signed an agreement for the Atlantic Charter, we agreed that all nations would become self-determining. But that's not what happened. No, that's not what happened at all. No, what we did was we created a global monetary system where the United States dollar became the economic hegemony. The United States dollar became the reserve currency of the entire global economy. And we, here in America, being the young, dumb nation that we were, we saw that as a, as a great thing as a source of our strength and power. And they still tell you that to this day on MSNBC, that the U.S. dollar is America's greatest export and it being the reserve currency is a source of our strength. It's a source of our strength we're depending on now. But they never tell you that you can only have a strong currency in dollar if you, A, manufacture things and have an equity economy, or B, you have a military big enough to intimidate everybody. And that's exactly what we've been doing, isn't it? That's exactly the, 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 uh, the, the racket that the neocons set up, even going back to post-World War II. Oh, the neocon, the neocon worldview, the, the military-industrial complex worldview and, and dominance got its, got its legs up and, and uh, running right there after World War II. And what we told people is, uh, you know, with our dollar, with the United States dollar as a reserve currency, our military isn't far behind. Where our dollar is, our military is. And that's why you have over 350 state-of-the-art golf courses. 350 state-of-the-art United States military golf courses all around the world. Where our money is, our military is. And if you decide to defect from that, that economic hegemony, we have, we can, and we will come and kill your ass. We will come and kill you or unseat you. We have done it. We can do it. We continue to do it. And in that way, we use the United States dollar as a military tool. 
And Vladimir Putin told you all, this is their thinking. They're not hiding it. They're not lying. They're coming right out and saying it. You guys thought you could bully us with the economic formation of the U.S. dollar as the global hegemony. And now we think a little different. We think we're going to be uh, rejecting that way of doing things. We got our own plans. We got our own ideas. We got our own, we got our own agenda. We got our own way of uh, being self-determining. It's called our own currency, our own economic hegemony. And we're going to get a few countries together, a few powerful countries with a few big consumer bases like the BRICS, and we're going to make a run at the U.S. dollar. Now, whether or not it's successful will ultimately depend on who can shoot the best, who has the best bombs. And that's what we're hurling towards. And that's what happens when you have a society that is, that is based on death and debt. You have a society where you have to use currency as a military tool, which will eventually cause you to have kinetic conflicts, war. And this is the way that the border working in both directions becomes a contradiction that your Democrats can so easily point out. We don't want to be the world's police. The MAGA movement is the anti-war movement. You better seize that opportunity and do it because it's genuine, not because it's politically expedient. I'm not telling you to do it to, for votes. I'm telling you to understand your history in this country as an American citizen and understand why George Washington said, beware of foreign entanglements. Embrace it. I mean, honestly, I, I mean, really believe in it, <laughs> believe that we are going to become the genuine anti-war party and movement in American politics. And if you do that, I guarantee you, I guarantee there is a vote out there for you. You couldn't possibly imagine there is a vote out there for us, for Donald Trump, that you could not possibly imagine. And if you need proof then I will take you back to the 1960s and 70s freedom movement, which was anchored on the referendum of the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah. yeah when identity politics first got its, its start, right there during the Civil Rights Act, where you had women's rights and black rights and gay rights come together in a coalition. It was galvanized by an anti-war peace movement against the Vietnam conflict. What I'm telling you ain't a conspiracy. Just go ahead and look it up. The anti-war peace movement during Vietnam was the galvanizing force of the early identity politics movement in America. So the proof is in the pudding. So all of these neocons that tell you, no, 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 no. An anti-war platform doesn't have any electoral value. Well, first of all, it has a human value. It has spiritual value. And then it just so happens to also have electoral value. And right now, your neoconservative and neoliberal warmongers on both sides of the aisle will stop at nothing to ensure that people like me never make it into your homes, into your children's schools, into your children's preferred content on social media, and certainly into the United States Senate to stop their warmongering corruption. What does that have to do with race? What's that? Everything. It has everything to do with race. That's why black people are saying right now, we don't want to send our money to Ukraine. We don't really care what happens to the Ukraine. And their white, neoliberal, neoconservative thought leaders continue to tell them, you just don't know enough. That's what Joe Frazier said. Oh, Forever Wars is just a bumper sticker issue for people who don't understand, who don't understand what's going on. Oh, we're not smart enough, Joe. Joe Fra Ukraine Joe, Ukraine Joe Frazier, he him, he him uh, Joe Frazier, Mr. Military Intelligence, Mr. Afghanistan and Iraq, Mr. I work for Wells Fargo.
Mr. If We're Killing Russians, I'm in. Ukraine Joe. We don't know enough. No, 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 no. That's not it. We don't. This is not that we don't know enough. We don't agree. <laughs> and because that worldview doesn't have a real constituency in today's Republican Party, now they have to go and try and find all the people they can trick and brainwash into believing that I'm an unfit candidate. That's the that's the go-to move now. Oh, he's just an unfit candidate. He's just not fit. He's got too many personal issues. But yet you support Donald Trump, Joe, and and Donald Trump's got more personal issues than I could even hope to accumulate. And I'm still voting for him. Felonies and all. I've never been convicted of a felony. Yet, I'm probably on the chopping block next, for sure, because we're living in those types of of lawfare uh, times. We're living in times of kangaroo courts and lawfare, so I might be next, but I'm still voting for the felon. The question is with a Joe Frazier. Well, not by his own testimony, because if you have personal issues and baggage, then you're not somebody we can trust to lead. Yet you're a Donald Trump supporter. How does that square, Joe Frazier? How does it square that a a National Republican Senatorial Committee man named, named Steve Daines is going to tell us Minnesotans that Joe Frazier would be more electable than a Royce White. For who? More electable to whom? To, go ahead and tell me. Who, do, who are they saying that Joe Frazier would be more electable to? It ain't the people down there in CD5 and CD4. They don't trust no Joe Frazier's. And it ain't because he's white. It's because he's hollow it's because he's uh you know it's just you know bland ain't nothing ain't ain't much there he just says it exactly how he's supposed to say it he says it exactly how a neocon would say it uh peace through strength we gotta you know make sure that that you know vladimir putin isn't emboldened to to, you know, track across all of Europe. And you're not European, Joe. You're not European. The people are sick of that. The people are sick of having to pay for the whole damn game. And anybody who wants to send another penny to that country, Ukraine, is spitting in the face of the American working class because it's all on your back. It's been on your back for a long time. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're brown, green, the whole game rests upon your shoulders. It's on your back. They're paying for the whole thing. And again, like I said on Saturday morning, the real scam here is you take our dollar. Our military is never far behind. If you want to get off the dollar, we'll kill you. We'll unseat you. We'll replace you. And it all gives us justification to steal our own people's money. The reason why we can have a reverse vassal empire where we pay those countries to protect them is because it gives your politicians and elites a justification to steal your shit. (laughs) Ain't that a good racket? Hey, 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 don't worry about it. We'll pay you to protect you. It's just going to give us an excuse to steal our citizens money and, and, and really energy. And when I say energy, I don't mean oil or electricity. I mean, that is a part of the equation, but I mean your human energy. That's how all of you out there, black, white, brown, or green, have become modern day slaves under a globalist regime. Your political elites have found a racket that allows them to claim peace, prosperity, democracy, and freedom all around the world and use the military. To guarantee it, just to turn around and steal your money and your energy, your human energy. Go to work, you can't even, go to work 10 hours in a day, you can't even put gas in your car. 20 years in Afghanistan, and what'd you get for it? An opioid crisis. 20 years in Iraq, and what'd you get for it? 
having to put more money up to defend Israel because Iran's taken over the entire Iraq country as a failed state. The Democracy and Freedom part ain't working too well, is it? It ain't working too well for you. You're the slave. They got you worried about the Europeans falling under the dictatorship of Russia. You're living under the dictatorship of your own political elites right here today in this country. You're supposed to be worried about if President Xi takes over Taiwan. If the Middle East overruns Israel. Middle East ain't overrunning Israel. They tried to attack Israel on three sides. Israel beat that ass. They just tried to attack them again. Iran tried to attack Israel again, and Israel beating that ass again. You're the target. You're, you are the fool in the, in the, in the equation. You, you Americans. Donald Trump sat right up there at the rally on Saturday. He said it himself. He goes, why don't we have an Iron Dome over America? That would be good, don't you think? And everybody goes, uh, yeah, <laughs> because they know what the question is. And the question's a perfectly fine question to ask. It's our technology and our money that built one of the most sophisticated air missile defense systems in the whole world, in the history of human civilization there in Israel. And it works great. That's why when the Iranians tried to send, you know, 500 front loaders, to, you know, rockets, into Israel, and I think like three of them got through. I don't even know if there was a single casualty. That's how good the Iron Dome works. And Donald Trump just said, hey, don't you think we should have one here in America? It's our money. It's our tech. Does that make him anti-Semitic? I don't think so. And that's the other one they're really trying to use, isn't it? I mean, when the when the Steve Danes of the world and the RJCs of the world and the Star Tribunes and the KSTPs and the New York Times all come to the same conclusion that I'm anti-Semitic because I say America first, what are they invoking? They're invoking that history back to World War II that I keep bringing your focus to so you understand the history of what's going on in this country and in the lexicon of your average American citizen. Every time a person stands up to say we should have a border and that citizenship is valuable, they call that person a fascist. They call them a fascist, and when they say fascist, they really mean Nazi, and they really mean that you're one step on the track to becoming Adolf Hitler. And that's why your Democrats often use the memes where they put Donald Trump's face next to Hitler's. And when they put Donald Trump's face next to Hitler's, they're trying to say that the Jews are the justification for global government and also used as a excuse to steal your money. Black people too. Oh, oh, racism. Oh, white supremacy is a worldwide phenomenon. If we don't have all of these international collaborations and, and governmental agencies like the United Nations, then, then white people are going to go on a killing spree of all you other minorities. Give us your money. Give us your money. We'll, we'll stop it. Haven't stopped shit yet. Haven't stopped a single thing. But you're still giving your money, aren't you? Uh, you, don't, you don't recognize? You don't get it? That's because they've done a great job of hiding that, too. $37 trillion in debt, and they're so good with the technology and the food production, they can make you feel like you got money in your pocket. <laughs> That's how phony fiat currency works. That is the brilliance of the modern-day slave trade, is your country can be $37 trillion in debt, $172 trillion in in unfunded liabilities and about a $9 trillion gap in social security. And they can still make you feel like everything's going well. And you got a fistful of twenties. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Donald Trump lives. Kamala Harris ain't black. The unit party is panicking because they know if young America first patriots like myself, ever make into that United States Senate, there will be a referendum on this country's permanent political class of the likes of which this, this nation has never seen before. 
and I will bring a reckoning, and there will be a referendum. I'm willing to go fight. All you have to do is send me. If you're in Minnesota or if you know people in Minnesota, you tell them August 13th is the Republican Party primary election, and they need to go and vote. Vote in the primary on August 13th. Vote America first. If there's another politician out there that talks to you the way that I do, vote for them. And I mean that honestly. And I'm talking all across the country. But if there's another politician in my election that you think talks to you more genuine and authentic and straightforward than I do, you vote for them. I don't even know who the other people running are. There's eight people that primaried. If one of them talks to you more straightforward than me, go ahead and vote for them. But you better not. You better not bring yourself to vote for a Wells Fargo military industrial complex shill who has he, him pronouns in his LinkedIn bio today, but wants to talk about cutting the funding, the, the DEI funding out of the Department of Defense budget. Oh, oh, well, where's the reckless spending, Joe Frazier? Oh, you know, it's $114 million in, in the Department of Defense DEI budget. I asked Joe Frazier in a, a candidate forum the other day for AMAC. I said, well, Joe, you're talking about the 144, 114, I don't know, one or the other, one of the you know, 114 trillion, uh, million dollars. You're talking about the $114 million in the budget. What about the $2 trillion that got up and walked out the back of the Department of Defense? Just got up and disappeared. $2 trillion worth of inventory during the last audit of the Department of Defense just disappeared. Nobody knows where it is. And it ain't the first time that's happened. Two trillion dollars. But you want to cut out the 114 million of DEI spending, but you got pronouns in your bio. I mean, are you kidding me? These are the these are actually the people. And what's even more scary is that a sitting United States senator actually thinks that person's more electable than me. That tells you what the common culture is of American politics. You get to choose now. It's not going to hurt me one way or another. I'm still going to be on radio every day. I'm still going to have the podcast, and people are only going to find out more. The point of the matter is you get to decide now if we have a country or not, if we save this country or not, if you let the narrative of this establishment prevail or not. Choose wisely. As the great Professor Penn would say, Make your decision, live with your decision. This has been another episode of Please Call Me Crazy brought to you by Free People Radio, powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us. Help fund the movement. Help support the movement. I believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what this establishment wants to take from you now. And I'll tell you this in closing. It is a miracle that Donald Trump wasn't killed. And it's not just about him personally. Had Donald Trump been killed that day, we very, may, we very well may have broken into complete chaos and violence, and all of us would now be under martial law. And God saw it in his, in his perfect wisdom to not allow that to happen. And we all get a second chance. We all get another chance to be involved in the political process and save this country and save this republic and do it by political participation. Do it by getting involved. Do it by going to vote. If they go and cheat, let it be that you overwhelm the system so, so much. The cheating they do is very visible. The cheating they have to do is very blatant. Let that be the outcome. But you do your part. If Donald Trump had been killed, we would very well, very well may be under martial law today. Don't squander this opportunity. Trump lives. Kamala Harris ain't black. We appreciate your viewership and listenership today and in the future. The people are coming. And as always, Godspeed.